I have some friends who I offer advice to from time to time, and uh, I guess it could be called friendship or mentoring or counseling or life coaching uh, or just listening to an old man blather about some of the things he's learned in life. Uh, an old man who evidently likes to speak in the third person. Um, I just received a message from a uh, a friend who is eh, just not feeling at the the top of life right now, and uh, is experiencing some things about uh, their significant other. They're just yeah, relationships not perfect. The, the other person's just not thrilled with everything. Um, work, there's some issues at work. They work as a employee. Uh, so, you know, the bosses and the situation is not what they would love for it to be. And, uh, they're choosing to feel some disappointment and stress and boredom and such from that. And, uh, family relationships aren't the best, like, uh, you know, parents, brother, sister, that kind of like, it's just not a, a good positive situation. Uh, doesn't really have a lot of pals that goes out and bums around with and doesn't get that, that guy time. And so I was thinking, you know, this is something that so many of us go through so often. And I'm guessing that those of you who are listening might say, I got a lot going on. Plus, I've got a bum left ankle and I'm 100 pounds overweight, and I'm balding, and I've lost a tooth, and I've been kicked out of my church, and blah, 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 whatever. Man, there's some crap that goes on in the human condition, isn't there? There's the there's the Buddhist thing that one of the foundations is that life is suffering. Boy, it sure seems to me that that's frequently true. And then that brings up the point of what is life about really? Like why bother? What's the, what's the deal with it? And you know, when I'm thinking that way, my perfect thing to think about that makes sense to me is uh, a pile of ants. Uh, and out in the, the American West where I am and where I ride ATVs, every so often I'll come upon a, an ant pile and it's probably two feet wide and a foot high. And it's just this mound of, little vegetation stuff and dirt that they've created. And I'm sure it goes down underground ways as well. And uh, I'll, I'll ride along on my ATV and either I'll see it. Now I don't run over them anymore because I'm, I'm trying not to be that kind of guy. But I have purposefully run over these ant hills before. And you run over them, whether accidentally or on purpose. And all of a sudden you see these hundreds of ants and maybe thousands below the surface that I'm not seeing are just running around in a panic. And Oh my gosh, it's the hurricane of the century that just hit. And Oh my gosh. And it, it moved the bedroom over where the bathroom was and blah, blah. And you just know that they're having this big drama, emotional moment. And there are hundreds or thousands of them that are panicking and running around doing stuff. And I think how insignificant that ant is to my life. How many ant piles have I run over and not realized I ran over them? And I've just continued as though nothing happened. No other human being was as close as me. So there's 7 billion other human beings that even, they give less of a crap than I do. And I think as humans, sometimes we have our own crap going on. And there are 7 billion other humans and all of the 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 blue beam aliens, all, all these other entities that don't really give a crap about us. They don't care. Maybe our dog does, but aside from our dog and maybe a good cat, aside from that, it, I I know sometimes I feel like well, nobody really gives a darn. And I'm not complaining. I don't I don't think I have a a right to have other people give a crap about my life or what's going on in it. Uh, but it is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of saddening to to be in that situation. 
Um, it, and I don't want to whine, but it just it sucks. And so what do we do with all of this? How do we uh, how do we move forward and make a good life? And, and I think a lot of that comes down to the what is the meaning of life? And I'm going to, when I edit this, I'll try to get rid of the background noise. I'm sitting on the balcony. The sun's going to be coming up within half an hour, or at least I assume it is. Um, so I'm down in uh, just a little town just north of Phoenix, on the border of Phoenix, basically. And uh, I'm We've got this awesome view, and I'm going to be watching the sun come up over Four Peaks. If you've ever had Four Peaks beer, it's pretty good. Kilt lifter. Okay, I'm going off on a, a tangent here, but I'm, I'm making excuses for the background noise because I don't want to go inside right now. It's a great temperature out here. So what is the meaning of life? And I guess we each are going to make different choices with that. It, it might depend on what our worldview is, what our biases are. Uh, how we were reared, how we choose to believe now. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't have your answer. I, I have my answer, but I don't know that it would apply to you. I think yours might be a different answer. And I, I would sure hope that you wouldn't think that your answer would fit me because I'm guessing it wouldn't. And so, if I'm being objective, then I would say that my answer probably wouldn't fit you. Um, I am not a theist. So, I, I think a lot of people reach low places in their life, or they were reared this way, but, but those might be the two way, most common ways of getting to a religious solution. So, somebody just says, everything in life fall apart, and then there's a local church that takes them in and makes them feel good and it's built around some very emotional moments and and then it's all going to be okay. Now you're our family. We're all a big happy church family and once or twice a week you feel that high. It, it diminishes over time, but by then there's been enough rote memorization and uh, not indoctrination, but teachings that you now feel like it's the right thing to do and that it's good and solid in the long run. And and I've noticed that that religion has been a, a solution for a lot of people. Um, and I guess it wouldn't have to be a theistic re religion or a, a monotheistic the religion. That's just kind of been my experience in the in America. Their their Christianity's the big deal, and then I guess Judaism is a another big one. And I'm a little bit familiar with Muslims, and so I think that's kind of the the practice with those religions, and those are all monotheistic. So I guess religion would be one answer, and then within that religion, it would it would have its books that, you know, each line can be interpreted, or I don't know if it can be, but it is interpreted 20 or 50 or 100 different ways by each part of the church who breaks off from each other. So there's there's that whole thing, which obviously I don't have a lot of love for. <coughs> And then there are probably another hundred or million other ways of looking at things. Um, and I, I have my way of looking at things that I don't know is correct. I don't really think there's an outside purpose for my existence. Uh, I, I don't think that the world needs me. Um, the things that I have accomplished that are big scale... Um, I led a project that created a world record in a re recreational activity, but that didn't change the world or make it a better place or like the, the world would be just fine if I hadn't done that. And I think as far as global reach, that's the only really big thing. I, you know, I guess through my, my business, my wife and I run a business and through that, we have introduced about 30,000 people to shooting sports, uh, recreational shooting, target shooting, that kind of thing. So I, I think that having done that promotion of firearms to 30,000 people, 25,000 of whom are high net worth, that probably has created some positive thinking in the world toward firearms. So I, I guess maybe that would be my biggest contribution to the world. 
But aside from that, uh, whether I live or die today isn't going to make a difference to a lot of people. And to the people who it would make the most difference to, I guess it would just be my wife, probably. It would probably kind of be disruptive in her life, and she'd be sad. Um, but I think within months or a year or so, she'd be able to, you know, still have some positive memories and some negative memories. But she, she you know, she would move forward and and build a great life. Uh, and a small part made possible by the insurance money, which is <laughs> something I always think, oh, that'd be nice for her. Um, yeah, I don't think it really matters that much. And so, so why do I choose? But yeah, every minute you live is a choice. Why do I choose to keep keep going? And for me, I, I've certainly had my low points. And I think there's a decent chance that when I die, it will be at my own hand. Uh, like, I don't really think I want nature or somebody else choosing when I die. That seems like a very personal choice. Uh, so, you know, I would imagine if I'm, if I'm old and I don't see that there's a lot more in life that that's going to be fun and good and productive and lovely. And, you know, I'm, I can barely walk and I get some bad disease. And, yeah, I probably just want to end stuff. And that's kind of my intention. Um, so I'm not opposed to uh, to, to stopping breathing. Um, but why do I choose not to do that today? And why am I pretty darn certain I won't next year either? What is the meaning? Why Why do I keep doing this? And I guess... For me, it's it's multifaceted. One thing is the joy that I get out of life. Um, one of the biggest joys is is it, it's like a big board game, right? not even a board game, but it's a big game that is so difficult to learn all the aspects of how to play it, and yet you can make some choices and then kind of have an idea of what's going to happen thereafter. Like for a lot, I don't know, 80, 90% of life kind of makes sense. And if I walk into a store and I pick something up and as I walk up to the clerk, I give a big smile and I say, Hey, how's your great day going? They're going to break into a smile and they're going to say something like, Whoa, I guess great. And then we're going to have this positive interaction and their happiness level has been elevated, and I'm going to feel awesome about myself when I walk out. I know that I can have that impact on other people because I practiced it and I've read about it and studied it. I, I, I know how to do this when I'm in the mood to do it. And I also know how to ruin somebody's day. I know how to gaslight somebody. I know how to do a lot of interpersonal kind of things. And they're almost always positive things to, I don't want to use the term, bring up the energy, because next thing I'll be saying, I'm going to bless you with this, with this podcast, but I, I'm making the world a happier, better place. I, that's kind of my hope and my goal. So, so this idea that I can change the things around me, I can move this piece. And by moving this piece on the game, I, I mean, I can I can go into a place and make somebody happy, make the clerk happy, and then the clerk is going to be happier to the next person who is maybe not going to flip off the person on the street 20 minutes later. <clears throat> and I love the impact I, I can have that way. I love that I can game the system, and if I want to get rich, I can get rich. And if I want to have a, a polyamorous relationship, I can do that. If I want to get married to a woman, I can. If I want to get married to a guy, I can. If I want to have 20 kids, I can. If I want to have no kids, I can. Like, there's so many awesome choices in life that you can kind of stack the deck so that it becomes what you want it to be. And, you know, there's still crazy stuff that happens. You know, you just, you build up your business in Acapulco and you plan to get a uh, insurance within the next week or so, and then all of a sudden the hurricane hits and it wipes you out. Yeah, there's some stuff like that that, um, you know, I guess you did have control. You could have gotten insurance first. Um, but there, there are still, there are things that can happen that you look back and you go, yeah, I don't see how I could have could have moved the pieces and had that turn out differently. <clears throat> so maybe it's this big, huge game. Maybe that's the aspect that I, I like the most about it. 
I was reared in abject poverty, just abject poverty. And I, not that I noticed or anything at the time that much. But now I'm sitting at our, uh, not our primary home, um, but we own it. And I'm, I've got this great view. I'm looking at palm trees and I'm looking at the, uh, the sunrise is about to happen. And I'm wearing a pair of shorts and I just got a cup of fresh coffee and it wasn't instant Folgers. It was good coffee. And I'm using the creamer that I like, even though it's more expensive than some of the other creamers. And I'm recording this on a Zoom H4N Pro, which is, I think, a couple hundred dollar recorder. And I'm, I'm not using a 1999 Timu recorder. So I guess I'm saying I get to live a very rich life, like not a one percenter kind of life, but I, I get to live a pretty rich life. And those are in large part due to choices we've made. I parked out on the street, I've got my uh, my F-350 pickup truck and a cargo trailer behind it. And the cargo trailer has a nice ATV in it. And the back of the truck is a, a nice ATV. And well, granted, the truck is 19 years old and the ATV is 24 years old. <laughs> but they're both in great working condition. They both look great. I just am a very tight, wad, frugal kind of guy. And uh, that's what I choose. But I have, I don't know, my dream pickup and some dream recreational machines sitting on the street. And I have those because me and my wife made the choice to to have some money in life and to to be able to, well, first of all, make sure that we're set uh, for comfort, not luxuries like that, but just for basic comfort, and, and then to start getting a few uh, luxury items. I don't know that a 2000 old ATV is considered a luxury item in 2024 or 2023. I guess that's when we are now. Um <clears throat> But to me, it feels that way. And I guess that's my choice to to be sad about what I have or to be thrilled about what I have. But but I guess I'm just kind of saying I, I'm appreciating the things around me. Uh, I, I, our patio furniture is comfortable. Like I'm sitting in a chair that I'm not in pain sitting here. Um, life, life is what we've built it to be in large part. And boy, have we ever had some failures. We've had some really bad things happen, getting close to bankruptcy. Uh, as a result of the housing market crash. Um, even though I was preaching Austrian economics, we weren't really living it, and we were doing the whole leveraging thing, and oh, life was looking... We were we had a really nice net worth on a piece of paper. And then 2007, 2008 hit, and uh, by 2010 or 11, things were pretty dire. We lost almost everything that we had built up in our life. We managed to hang on to a little bit and then rebuild, and, and now we're better off. So I think that that game, playing the game, is just entertaining. It's just entertaining. And I, I think that might be one of my my greatest joys, is getting to see how, when you move this piece, this happens. <clears throat> So that's 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 a biggie for me. I, I guess another might be a reason to just to have the energy to say, you know what, I want to keep doing this, would be the, the, the small joys, whether we brought them about or not. So this is kind of a, a separate issue. But being able to appreciate the, uh, I see these red flowers on the bushes surrounding the pool. And those are really cool red flowers on the bushes. And up where we live the rest of the year, we don't have red flowers this time of year. It's likely we're going to get some drizzly blowing snow today or something. Um, it's it's getting cold. Been way below freezing uh, multiple times already. And it's not even November yet. Um, so I'm, I'm really appreciating looking at these beautiful flowers. And the palm trees, there's this light breeze. And just the way they're they are so delicately kind of waving. Like they're almost silhouetted. Uh, against the sky. It's so cool. Um, I see people out walking their dogs and and I judge the people and I judge the dogs and I think about that's probably the best friend that person has is that dog. Like, is that person I'm watching right now with the, the long sleeve black shirt wearing a, a, a white vest 
over an overweight lady walking a, a little dog. It, what is her regular life? Uh, does she have a really happy life? Does she have a ton of friends who just really want to hang out with her? Um, is she going to be going on a walk with them and playing pickleball later? Uh, or whatever people in our uh, little retirement town play. Um, is that what she's planning to do? Is she going to be going to a philosophy roundtable luncheon this afternoon? Uh, what is her life like? What are her joys? What's What's going on with her? And why did she choose that little dog that's not very attractive? Was it a rescue from a shelter? And, and is she feeling good about herself for having saved that dog? Or because it's kind of weird looking, does she get a lot of attention? And she doesn't because of her physical appearance. She doesn't because of other reasons, but but the little dog, people, oh, look at that little dog. And then she gets some positive reaction from the person on the street. Is that why she chose that dog? I don't know. That, and that was just one example of someone walking by at this at this moment. Um, and I, I don't know anything about her. Like I could be completely wrong about everything, but I love people watching. That's fun. So I love watching trees sway in the breeze. And I love red flowers. And I love the mountains. And I love sunrises. And, and I, I love yesterday taking my truck into a mechanic where I think I was messed over. <clears throat> I left the the shop when they gave me the, the quote. And he says, yeah, all in, it'll be of a thousand whatever. And so I just rounded up because I knew there'd be taxes. It'd be 1100 bucks. And I actually even sent my wife a message and she says, hey, just so you know, the truck's in the shop for an $1,100 thing, but it's all good. I'm going to pick it up tomorrow and we're, we're set. So I documented what the amount was, and then I go to get it, and it's fourteen sixty five or something like that is what they charge. And they go, oh no, that's I I told you that's what it would be. Yeah, whatever. Like I, I'm not certain enough that I'm going to blow them up on <coughs> uh, Google reviews, but eh, I think I got messed over. But that's awesome. Like what a cool learning experience. Um, I'm fifty years old. I've had my vehicles fixed a number of times. Like. I don't go out and buy new cars. We have old cars. That's what we do because it's the frugal, smart way to do stuff. We get old cars with low miles. This is what we do. But then they do have more mechanical problems than brand new cars. So I've been to mechanics. I know how this goes. And yet I got taken, I think. I got taken to the tune of uh, 300 and something bucks. Um, yeah, and it wasn't like they, they said, oh, we found the third thing that was more money. No, it was just what they said they would do. And they didn't even do one of those, which is why I had to go back. But that learning experience, even though I could say, oh my gosh, it's horrible. And I'm, oh, now I've got a $1,465 bill. and bought. Well, no, it, that's education. That goes under the education column. Um, I remember Bama, uh, Robert Lindsay Nathan, he would talk about uh, how expensive education is. And you know, you do something really stupid in life and or you just have something happen and you say, well, education sure is expensive sometimes. <laughs> yep. You know what? You're right, Bama. It is. Um, so I just I paid fourteen hundred and sixty five bucks for some education and I got the truck fixed mostly uh, for that. So I don't know. That was a fun, exciting, good learning experience. That was a that's a positive thing overall, I think. Ah, the sun's just peeking up now. That's cool. So I'm going to have to head in soon. It'll be 800 degrees in about five minutes, probably. Yeah, so those are some of my reasons for, for choosing to move forward in life and get some joy out of it when I can. And and so I mentioned religion, and I, and I mentioned the gaming aspect of it. I, I mentioned the idea of just getting joy from, you know, not from your accomplishments or lessons from learning, uh, from uh, gaming the world, but from just noticing stuff around you. Um, that's, that's another, you know, those are three things. And there are probably another hundred or million things that various people have thought of as good reasons why they go, yeah, this, this whole life thing's okay. I'm going to keep doing this. And it's definitely a choice. Um, but yeah, I, it, it would be my strong recommendation to anybody to, uh, yeah, make a game out of it. Like keep going, keep, keep seeing what's up. Um, 
keep marching forward. And, and I guess a big part of that for me, a, a big recommendation would be to figure out what it is that you really want in life. Like not just sitting around and feeling, well, I just want to be happy and rich. No, no, no. Really think about what you want. Well, let's talk about that now. I've heard two things that I guess we could say it's opposing, but I'm not sure that they're opposing. They might just be different perspectives. When we're thinking about goals, we can say that we want such and such a goal, and therefore the means to achieve that end, the means are doing one, two, three. And then the other way of looking at it would be, I like to do one, two, three, or I think one, two, three is the right thing to do or the good thing to do. And so I'm just going to do one, two, three, and I'm not even going to think about the ends, but there's a good chance that if I do one, two, three, then I will come, come out in the end having those ends. So I don't know that it matters which way we look at that, but I do think that if you do have an end in mind, you're going to be better off. Even if you don't completely achieve that, and even if you change direction mid-course, you're way better off. Because when you have this end goal in mind, it's not something that's written in stone. You can change it any time. You can update it, move it around, blah, blah, blah. And so one of the best methods that's helped me was, oh gosh, this has been over 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, something like that. Uh, a fellow who was my mentor at the time a, a very wise man, and maybe that's why I chose him to be a mentor, gave me the advice, because I, I just wasn't feeling thrilled with what was up in life. You know, I was single, I was a new cop, and uh, I, I wasn't making money, and it was just, yeah, I wasn't thrilled with, with life. And, and he suggested that I do this exercise. He said that I should take a piece of paper every day and write down the five things that I want in life, the five things I would want from a wife, and the five things I would want from my vocation, occupation, job, whatever you want to call it. And so I did that for a time, for years. And his instructions were that, that I jot it down and then... I do that in the morning and at night. And then as things change, I'm not just copying over what I wrote from the previous day. I should be writing down what it is that I really truly want. And at the time, I think my job things were that I wanted to uh, be making a certain amount of money. I wanted frequent international travel. I wanted uh, some danger and some excitement. And I wanted to, I don't know, I had my five things that I wanted in a job. And I wrote those down every morning, every night. And then the five things I wanted in a, a wife or a woman or a girlfriend or whatever. It could have been a guy. I mean, it doesn't matter. And I, I wrote down, I remember at the time I was, I had had a, a girlfriend who wasn't that bright and I'd had another one that was a, a bigger gal. And, and so I kind of put the things together that I hadn't liked about various people. And I, I wrote that I would like her to have a, at least a bachelor's degree. I would like her to have a low body fat index. I would like her to be kind and caring and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I, I wrote these five things down over and over and over. And in time, I think they came to fruition. And I think the next two gals I dated, uh, the next one had a bachelor's degree and the next one had a master's. I just as, as one example, and they were both slender gals. And then I, I constantly reevaluated life. I go, well, I guess that isn't exactly what I wanted because they weren't perfect for me. They were perfect for them, but they weren't perfect for me. And so I changed what I wrote down every morning, every night. 
And then I got her. And now, now this isn't a foolproof thing, but where the mind goes, energy flows is the saying that some of the gurus will say. I mean, it, there's, I think, some truth to that. So I would suggest writing these things down and seeing where you end up. And you might write down that you really want to have coffee each Wednesday morning with the local old men down at the coffee shop. And that's at this moment what's of interest to you. And then you might find out that they're boring and dumb and all they want to do is talk about sports ball. and They don't have big minds. And so then you're going to change it. You're going to say, I want to have at least weekly uh, positive intellectual interactions with thinkers uh, who are, are, are bound by reason and logic and evidence and such. And maybe that's what your area of interest is. Like for me, that, that'd be really cool. Um, and for, for me, where I turn for that is disenthrall. Uh, I love that. It's kind of the, the technology is such that it's not accessible to, to everybody. You have to kind of be a gamer and know your stuff, be young, um, to be able to figure it all out and make it work. But w when I was doing that, I, I, I very much enjoyed that intellectual stimulation of, of that community. So find your community like that. Um, that that's huge. Uh, if you write down that that's what you want, and then you start getting involved, if you just said, I want to be involved in an intellectual community, having discussions about things that matter, and then you start getting into it, and you realize, oh my gosh, this whole World Economic Forum community chat that's happening each week, these people don't really understand the scientific method and they are idiots and they're trying to run the world. Okay, then just add to your list of five things what is it you really want. And so I would suggest doing that. And as a matter of fact, uh, for those of you who want to, write your things down and post it as a comment. Um, post, post your five things for your your job, five things for your significant other, five things for your uh, livelihood, your work. Uh, maybe some other people will look at them and go, hey, I hadn't thought of that. That would be cool to have that aspect at work. Um, that could help other people. So if anybody wants to do that, feel welcome to. But it's more important that you just write it down yourself. And I would say, be old-fashioned. Do it by hand. Heck, really push yourself. Do it in cursive. <laughs> but just get a notebook and, uh, you know, get, get a used one at the thrift store for 50 cents. That's what I would do. And uh, just write it in this book. And then next, next, that night, flip the page, write out the, the 15 things again. Um, so that, that, I think, is a useful uh, tip or tool. I suspect that if you do that consistently, and, and I, I wouldn't expect immediate results. I wouldn't even check for the results. I would just do that for a year. And then see where you are. And I'll bet you you're going to be at a better place. And, and I kind of liken this to physical exercise. Uh, and doing this, this little 555 exercise, uh, mental exercise, is not going to completely change your world immediately tomorrow. It's going to take a lot of other stuff. Uh, but if I you know, do the example of physical exercise... Me doing five jumping jacks every morning and every night isn't going to make a huge change in my physical fitness level. But if I'm otherwise pretty sedentary, and I did that every morning and every night, then after having done that for a year, I would most certainly be in better physical condition than if I hadn't. And again, it wouldn't be perfect, but it would be better. And making these little incremental changes toward better Boy, oh boy, do they ever add up. You know, maybe after a month of doing these jumping jacks, I'm starting to think, you know, these five are kind of boring. Why don't I do 10? Or why don't I do two push-ups also? Or why don't I... And then all of a sudden, a year later, you're you're rocking it. You know, you've lost some weight. You've toned up. You're, you're feeling better. And I think the same thing is true mentally. Um, that, that's a, a good trick, a good goal, good thing to do. I want to chat a bit about relationships, about significant other, like romantic 
relationships. And I'll just start by saying they ain't easy. And I haven't, I've been married once, so I, I, I can't say that I've, you know, I've been married seven times. I'm really good at this. <laughs> I don't have that much experience. Uh, I have been married for 20 years now and with the same woman for 22 years. And we have our ups and our downs and we have our times when we feel close to each other and we have our times when we don't. We have our times when we're compatible intellectually and our times when we're not. We have our times when we're compatible sexually and when we're not. We are times when we're compatible financially and we have the same goals and, and desires and work ethic and, and general direction. And we have our times when we're not. We have our times when we're both on the same page about eating healthy and working out. And we have our times when we're not. We have our times when we're each thrilled with what the other person is choosing to focus on in their life. And we have our times when we're, we don't, we're not. And I don't know, I, I could probably give 50 or hundred more examples if I thought about it and jotted them down, but y you get what I'm saying. Two completely separate people coming together and then trying to live a life together. It's not a recipe for ease. It's a recipe for a lot of heartache and for way better highs than you would get without it. So the highs and the lows are gonna be exaggerated when you choose to have a significant other, which is absolutely a choice. I have at least half, maybe three quarters of a book that I've had a, just kind of on hold for years. I haven't, I haven't spent more than an hour on it in the last three years, but I, I was thinking of a title of something to the effect of uh, to the effect of romantic relationships uh, for the libertarian or or something like that. Just deeply examining relationships, and I, I say that to say that I, I put a lot of thought into this. And this wasn't my my recent kind of book where I say to Chat GPT, "Hey, I'm thinking about blah blah blah. Write it for me," um, and then I just go in and edit it for. 40 or 80 hours. Like this is back when you actually wrote books. Um, so, so I put some thought into this and one of my big conclusions is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have lifelong monogamous relationships. It's what my wife and I have chosen to do. And it's what a lot of other people choose to do, but I, I sure wouldn't advise it unless a person really thinks it through. If you think it through and you say of all the options out there for ways that I might do this, this is the one that is really going to work well for me. And I'm going into it with eyes wide open. Great. Do it. I, my wife and I made that choice and, and we're doing it and we're happy. And I think we're both relatively fulfilled. <laughs> I hope she is. Um, and, and actually, I know that she's not in a number of ways. I know there are a number of ways that I'm just not cutting it as far as she's concerned. Like, I'm sure she would much prefer that I was different in a number of ways. And there's some areas that I, I wish she would be different. But overall, man, we love each other. We like each other. We enjoy each other's company. And we make sure that we have our, our time apart um, to rejuvenate, to refresh, to relax, and then come back into our together time. Um, and for us, it's a little bit easier since we are a little bit older and a little bit more settled financially, it's, it's a little bit easier. It wouldn't be as easy if we were living in a one bedroom apartment and dirt poor, you know, renting and both of us working two jobs at 40 hours each. And, you know, both of us working a grand total of 80 hours a week doing separate things and our paths are crossing and that, that would be tougher. Uh, I, I completely get that. Uh, however, I, I think it's, I think that uh, I think that time apart is important. And part of the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm uh, coming up on the end of uh, about two weeks of being on a walkabout. And that's what I call it. I'll go on a walkabout and I'll go visit some friends and take the ATVs and go riding and do some writing and reading. And of course, I'm still spending some hours each day 
checking emails and doing business stuff. Uh, I'm still doing that. So I'm not completely free and on vacation, like not having any contact with the real world, but uh, it's, it's a good relaxing time for me. And I kind of, I come back refreshed and rejuvenated. And my wife does the same thing. She's going to take a trip uh, next month for probably two or three weeks and, and just do her thing. And having that time is uh, a, a good time to kind of remember where we are. And then when you get back together, you're like, oh yeah, I did try living singly for the last week or two or whatever. And I really do like being with you. This is way better. I've played the field. Like I'm not dating other people, but I went out and I saw how it was to be without you. And I do prefer being with you. Uh, so I think that's an important part of a relationship. Uh, th there's a lot of advice out there about really having long, frank discussions with your significant other. Uh, I wouldn't suggest doing that um, until you're really familiar with the differences between how men and women think and how they communicate. Um, and this is touchy, a touchy topic because I think that the the mainstream idea right now is that everyone is 100% equal and men and women are both have the same biological social foundations and understandings of logic, reason, emotion, compassionate caretaking, drive, ambition, aggression. Like I, I think I'm supposed to say that everybody's exactly the same and everybody's equal. Um, but, but I'm not going to say that. I, I think that there's some differences between men and women and there, there are some, some people, some individuals, some outliers that don't, you know, completely meet what uh, the average is or what the mean is. And so I'm not claiming that everybody is exactly the same, but there's some, there's some big differences, I think, between men and women. And by and large, they, they're known. They fall into particular categories. Um, you know, I think about one of the J Jordan Peterson examples of, you know, if there's a, a single gal and she's getting into her mid thirties, she's probably going to find a guy and have a kid. Like that's a natural instinct. And yeah, maybe she was a anti-children, anti-feminist during, or pro-feminist, anti-child, anti-husband. And she had her experiences in her twenties and early thirties. And then now for some reason, she doesn't know why, but her biological clock is ticking and, and she doesn't know why, but she's now getting these desires, these, these natural drives to, uh, to have a kid. And if you're a guy who is getting ready to get hooked up with a 33 year old and you think you never want to have a kid and she says that she never wants to have one, just know that there's a 80 or 90% chance that her preferences, her feelings will change in the upcoming few years. And you're going to have a kid. That's just the way it frequently goes. So, don't have frank conversations with your partner if the, your partner and you don't understand the same things, if you don't communicate in the same way. Every person who's interested in having a, a romantic relationship with someone of a, a different gender ought to read Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. You got to read that. That's a, that's a must read. If you read that, and if you study a little bit of psychology, and when I say study, it can be casual study. You don't have to get a textbook out, but uh, I don't know. Just go on to YouTube and look for things like uh, psychological curiosities about men, psychological curiosities about women. How are men and women different? Blah, blah, blah. Just that kind of, just get creative and punch in a bunch of stuff like that and and watch. See what see what pops up and, and see what various people's, perceptions are and they could be wrong but at least let those go into your brain and noodle on them for a while and see what see what you think um until you have really studied how per, a person of another gender uh thinks and just how their brain works 
it isn't wise to have open, honest communications. Whoa, wait, what are you saying, Shepard? Well, yeah, it's not. You're going to say stuff that is going to be hurtful. It's going to come out wrong. You didn't mean it that way, but you're going to really hurt the other person. And you need to learn how they think, how they hear things, how they communicate before you do that. Um, it's just, that's that's a another piece of advice. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of go against that advice, except now we're skipping forward until after you have both opened your minds and really realize that you communicate differently. You've read a couple books, watched some videos. Now you have a little bit better idea. It would be a good idea to see what your significant other's uh, lists of five are. If you are thinking that in, you know, your, your life goal is to have a net worth of $10 million as soon as possible, retire as soon as possible, have a Florida home on the water as soon as possible, have a Colorado ski condo as soon as possible. If those are your life goals, and then your your wife or your girlfriend is thinking, um, donate at least 40 hours a week at an animal sanctuary. That's the life goal. And um, be an occasional guest on NPR's Saving the Animals show. And uh, live in New York City in an apartment that uh, is environmentally sustainable. In other words, it uses a, a lot of electricity that comes from coal-fired plants, but you don't have to see the coal-fired plants. Anyway, I'll skip over that. Um, those are some things that would really create a, a tough relationship. If you guys have opposite long-term goals and they're not, they're not together at all, that could be a real problem. So maybe as you're doing your searching for the perfect spouse, if you're at that stage, if you don't already have uh, contracts completed, then that could be something worth thinking about and communicating with your potential spouse about. If you're going different directions, then maybe if you're going to do a contract, a relationship, uh, relationship contract, maybe it shouldn't be a until death do us part contract. Maybe it should be a one-year contract. Maybe it should be a two-year contract. Maybe it should be as long as it's mutually beneficial to both of us contract. Uh, it, it would be worth considering some of the, the less traditional ways that relationships can be. Because uh, if, if you guys are both going nowhere or both going different directions quickly, then I'm not saying don't enjoy each other's company as another human being for the next while, but she shouldn't be building her 30-year goals and you building your 30-year goals if they're opposite, and then you think you're going to be together the whole time, like unless you think of a way to round that, that might not be the best way to go. So that would be a, a good hunk of advice is, is making sure that you're you're on similar on a similar page with that. How much are you going to give up yourself for the other person? And how much of what they want will they give up for you? Now, compromise is definitely a four-letter word when it comes to principles. We would never compromise on our principles. That would be awful. However, we can compromise on our preferences. You want the Florida home and the Colorado home, and she wants the New York home. Well, how can you compromise? She doesn't want to be live in an area where there's, I don't know, freedom and, and quiet and peace and nice people, and you do. So how, how do you come to a a compromise on that? How do, you, how do you find a, a common ground? And how much are you willing to give and how much is she willing to give? And if it would be absolutely miserable for her to have to deal with people in Florida and it would be miserable for you to have to deal with people in New York, well, first of all, you're right. But how do you, how do you come to, a, how do you come to a, a, an agreement with that? If you choose the person over your other preferences, that's one option. Just make sure with a clear head that you can do that long term. Don't just think you can. 
Right. Really noodle on this and make sure that you 100% are able to put aside the things that you've always thought so that you can do this. Um, this was a this was a big deal when I met uh, my current wife. Her former husband had been a, a Navy guy. And she was used to him being gone for half a year or 10 months at a time. And she held down the home front. And it was, I think part of it was during a time of when the, the U.S. government had him out doing uh, uh, imperialist stuff. But I'm not sure. It wasn't in the height of a war where, like, every day she's like, yeah, there's a 50-50, he's going to be dead. But there was that element of concern that his ship could be bombed or whatever. Um, so she had lived with that. And she did not, a couple things that she wanted in a husband were that he would be home most of the time, like not traveling for many months at a time, and that he would have a safe job. Well, you might recall from earlier, one of the things I had been writing down on my perfect uh, job list would be frequent international travel and dangerous, exciting work. And, and my direction had been uh, international executive protection, kind of a, being a, a big time bodyguard, traveling the world, being a tough guy, maybe doing some other special projects and such. And well, I couldn't do both. And, and actually I didn't just drop that all because of my wife. She, she had a part in that. But it's also much easier not to pursue huge dreams like that and to go for something easier, and more achievable, closer to home and, and such. So I wound up just being a cop for another, I don't know how many years, three, four, five years. Um, and then got to have a little bit of the excitement by becoming an entrepreneur and doing other things. But... I was willing to give up a huge life dream that I wasn't making steady progress on. I just I want to make it absolutely clear that that I wasn't an inch away from being Elon Musk's uh, director of security operations. And then my wife came into the picture and I had to give it all up and, and start bagging groceries. It, it wasn't like that. I, I wasn't I wasn't almost there. I was thinking it generally headed in that direction, but I wasn't there at that point. So just want to make that clear. Don't want to put put guilt on her. But I was willing to make a big change in what it was that I wanted in life. And I think knowing how much you're willing to change, knowing how much the other person's willing to change, that's important. As I mentioned, I have a whole book on this, not a whole book, half or three quarters of a book on this stuff. I could go on and on and on about all my thoughts and musings, but I'm going to just shut myself down there uh, as far as relationships go and just kind of summarize by saying they will bring you your happiest moments and your most, most frustrating, sad, depressing moments. And uh, I love what a minister who married my wife and I said uh, about a, a wedding ring. He said, this ring, uh, the purpose of it is to remind you why you're together when you forget why you're together. And it's just kind of that symbol. Uh, so have, have it in your brain that there are going to be some tough times and perhaps you're not going to be the perfect match for the person. Perhaps they need to go out and find their bliss elsewhere. Perhaps you do. Um, that boy, breakups from what I hear are just miserable. I haven't had many bad ones, but um, I've had a couple that were tough and man, they suck. And those weren't after years of being together. Uh, so I can't, I just can't imagine. And then I think about my wife and I, like our, we work in the same business. We have the same bank accounts and, and financial plan and homes and like everything is so uh, entwined that the further you get along in life and the more you've put into things, the bigger of a deal it would be to, to go your separate ways. And so I'm, uh, I'm thinking that if you're you're thinking it's not going to work with somebody and you're fairly new into your relationship, that's an awesome time to to split paths. Um, there's a certain point that as you keep going, that it's like, no, I just 
I don't have the energy to go out and find somebody else that I want. And I, I know it's nature to want to go out and for men to go out and breed the herd. And it's nature for a, a woman to want to have a, a protector person with them to be their companion and, and help keep them safe as they go through life. That's just kind of biological stuff that, you know, we can try to intellectual our way out of, but that's kind of how things are. So a lot of people who have bad breakups, I'm never, ever going to be in a relationship again. Men suck or women suck. And, and then within months or years, you're, well, this guy is different or this gal is different. It's going to be okay. And, and, it's just kind of the nature, so you have to you have to know that that's probably going to be the case with you as well. Uh, just make good choices, <laughs> make good choices, and and keep your commitments, and don't make commitments that you don't think you can keep. Uh, like the marriage of uh, the commitment of marriage is ridiculous. Like I'm choosing you, and I'm going to be with you no matter what you do, no matter what I do, no matter how our our personal goals and and desires and worldviews change. Even if it's completely horrible for us to be together, I will still be with you 35 years from now, 40 years from now, 60 years from now. That is the most stupid contract you could enter. Now, having said that, I entered that contract. And one of the benefits of that contract is that comfort, that peace, if you're with an honest person, that you know that they're for you. They're there for you. They are in your corner. It, you can make some mistakes and they are still there for you. They've promised they're not going to divorce you. Like, that's what marriage is. Now, what are the statistics? Something like half of the people are dishonest about it. And, and I would say that it's not dishonesty if you renegotiate a contract and both parties come to mutually acceptable new contract. Uh, but to go to somebody and say, hey, I, you know, I promised I would rent this apartment for a year and now we're six months into it and I would like to move out. Well, wait a minute. You, you committed to a full year. Or in, this, in the case of marriage, if you do it in a silly traditional way, you're committing to a full life of it. Take that stuff pretty seriously. Um, don't just do it because you're having some fun between the sheets. Like, make sure you're compatible in some pretty nasty situations before you do that. Uh, like, be poor. Be Have one of you be sick and need to be waited on. Uh, be in scary situations. I don't know. Travel to some dangerous developing countries or something and see how the other person handles things. Do some, do a lot of experiences together where you can kind of see what the other person's doing and see if they would be a good fit for you. All right. Now I'm going to quit blathering about what I said I would quit blathering about a few minutes ago. Jobs, being happy at work, uh, vocations. That is a tough one. That is a tough one. Different personalities are good at different things. Um, I'm going to try to remember, if you listen to this and you look down in the description and I forgot to do it, write a comment and I will add a description. That'll be my, my reminder to add a link in the description to a test that we actually have our staff do uh, as part of the hiring process to figure out which of the three types of person that they are. And I learned this in a Tony Robbins event that I attended, uh, Business Mastery. It was so clarifying to break it down to only three areas. So one type of person is an artist. And the artist is the person who is good at a particular thing. So it, it doesn't have to be creativity, but a, a woodworker who just puts out master, masterful work, that's an artist. An accountant who is just very good at crunching numbers, that that person is an artist. Uh, a physician is an artist. Uh, a person who doesn't have many skills but is kind of committed to one thing. The person who's working as a, a front desk clerk at a, at a motel, that person is an artist. They're doing that one topic, that one project. That's what they do. And then another type of person is the entrepreneur. And this person might not have mastery of the individual things like being a good desk clerk at a hotel, motel for 40 years or being a good physician. Maybe their brain is just bouncing all over the place, 
but they're really good at saying, oh, hey, why don't we get a, uh, a good desk clerk and a good physician, and then we'll have a hospital where you come and you get surgery, and then you can also spend the night and bringing these people together. Then go, oh, hey, why don't I find an investor? Oh, hey, why don't I, um, oh, look at this. There's a painter. I can have the painter who wants to display their work pay me a part of their commission for hanging their artwork in my new hotel hospital. So the entrepreneur is just kind of thinking of all kinds of cool, crazy, fun ideas. And, uh, and then the entrepreneur has a problem. The entrepreneur is not good at managing things. So this is where the third type of person comes in, the manager. And the manager is able to hear what the, the entrepreneur says. Hey, we need to find a good physician who's willing to sign up for a five-year contract. And we need to find a desk clerk who will sign at least a five-year contract. We need to find the, uh, the real estate. Here's some things I've learned about real estate. It needs to be in a good location. It can't be something that needs to have repairs. So make sure you have it inspected. Uh, blah, 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 blah. We need to have a budget for this whole thing. We need to have a... Uh, uh, person who's good at writing, write up the business report that I can take to investors to try to get funding for this, blah, blah, blah. The entrepreneur doesn't have the attention span to focus on doing all of those things. However, the entrepreneur is willing to have a, uh, a comfort with the risk that it takes to go for these big projects like this. I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. And the manager is one of the rarest and definitely the most important person for a for an entrepreneur because the manager carries it out they manage the the project the thing and make it all happen and uh, when we were going over this at the seminar tony points to the to, he says to the room hey look at all these people when he was having us raise our hands for which group we're in he says look at all the people who are raising their hands for managers right now those of you who are entrepreneurs like, remember who has their hands up and go talk to them during break and hire them. That's who you need if you're going to be successful. So managers are just incredibly valuable. Um, if that's who you are, um, <laughs> well, first of all, just be in touch with me. Uh, it, we'll hire you. Um, the person who is truly a good manager, who has that personality type and has developed themselves over the years to be good at that, holy cow, thank you for being you. Um I am horrible at that, just as, as an example. So those three groups, the artist, the uh, entrepreneur, and the manager, I am a combination of artist and entrepreneur. What are you? Uh, know that about yourself. I, I'm not saying that one is right or wrong or, you, well, you should try to be more of something else. No, not at all. You be you. Uh, of course, improve yourself, but just know that you probably fall primarily into one of those categories and you're probably a big hunk of another one and hardly any of the third one or maybe you're a well-rounded person who's a third 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 uh and this is just one way of looking at it but i i like this system you know there's the disc the uh briggs meyer they're all all these different ways of measuring personality types and what you might be good at or happy with uh but i i just happen to like this one so I, I bring this up to ask you the next question. I don't have the answer to this, but you, you do, or you can noodle on it and maybe come up with the correct answer. Is the current thing that you're doing, the current vocation, what you're naturally good at? Is it what makes you happy? Is it what makes you fulfilled? And, and by no means am I saying that we should do jobs that we like, or we should follow our passion, like that advice that's been given um, I'm, I'm not in love with it. Like, it's really cool if you can enjoy what you do at work, but no, the goal is to go out and produce value for others. You get some, some of what you want in exchange for that. You get the money and then you go out and you follow your passions with that money and with the time, other time. But when you're working, you're, you're doing something that you're good at producing value. You're getting some in exchange. If you can enjoy it also wonderful. If it's along lines of your passions, wonderful. That's great. But that's not the that's not the the woke, just do what you love. Um, no, that, because if what you love is singing, you're probably not going to be a well-paid, awesome singer. Like maybe you're decent, but just go have fun at karaoke. Make yourself a mixtape or 
or <laughs> you, for those of you who don't know what that is, back in the old days, we had these things called cassette tapes and you could record onto them and you would make a tape for a friend that had all the different songs on it that you liked that your friend probably didn't. But then that was a great gift to give. Anyway, that's what a, a mixtape was. Um, you as a, as a worker, it doesn't have to be the same thing as your passion, but it would sure be handy if it's what you are naturally good at. If you're naturally a manager and you're very risk averse and you're trying to uh, start up new businesses and coming up with the ideas and, and deciding where to find the real estate, what to do, like you're not going to be as good at that as an entrepreneur would. And if the entrepreneur tries to do that, they're going to forget to pay the rent on the current office space they're leasing and they're going to lose it along with the computers in it that they're holding for collateral. Like the entrepreneur will mess up that basic stuff that a manager is needed for. Um, meanwhile, the, the artists, which are, I think most common, um, the best artists are very rare, but that artist category is, I think the biggest category. Those people, I'm not going to say they aren't as important, but the, the people in the bottom half of that category aren't very important at all. Uh, like the person who is a mediocre CPA, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of those around the country. Like that person doesn't matter as much. Now, when I say that, if, you, if you're not a good producer, if you're not that smart or not that hardworking, let's say you're a CPA, but you were at the bottom part of your class. You were just good enough that you ended up, you didn't have to go to the IRS. You were able to stay in the, the free market, but you went for a, a the best job you could find, which was an assistant to a, an established CPA. And you never really progressed there. And then you ended up going to work for another one and then another one. And, and just you're getting along, but you're not getting paid that much. And well, you are the opportunity for some entrepreneur who can't afford a top level artist. You still, you can change that at any point. You can move within that, that artist category. You could even move to other categories. If you train yourself hard enough, that's what I have to do. Um, you can, you can do that, but it's up to you how much energy and effort and uh, all that stuff that you want to put into it. Okay. So, so knowing which your category is, I think is helpful. And once you have that, then be comfortable with what you're going to get out of it. And if you're not comfortable with it, then change what it is that you're willing to do. And so here's an example for me. I'm an idea guy. Like that's just who I, I, I feel like I am. I would love to toss out a hundred fresh ideas a day. I'm guessing 98 of them wouldn't be all that great. But one of those ideas would probably double the gross income for a particular business. And another idea I have might, I don't know, reduce traffic collisions on a, a stretch of road by 30% over the next 20 years. Like I have some really great ideas. The vast majority of my ideas are horrible and they suck, but I have some really good ideas. Well, I'm not good at some of the other entrepreneurial things, but that puts me in the entrepreneur category. But I'm not good at some of the other things like taking risks. I am so scared. I, I'm in the market for a bigger chainsaw. My other two chainsaws are about 50 cc's uh, and I and I know I want quality. I know it's a good investment. So I want to go with a steel chainsaw and I'm, I'm just have this uh, paralysis through analysis or by analysis or whatever thing going on. Oh, do I want the MS391 chainsaw or the MS462? Well, the 462 has so many electronics on it that it, it, it's, you know, if there's an EMP, which I think there's a very small likelihood of that, but it got to take it into consideration if that happens, or if there's a, a supply chain shortage, it's going to be harder to get an electrical control widget for the throttle control than it would be a good old fashioned spring with a cord that a handy person could fashion out of a, an old plow blade. Um, so maybe I should go for the lower tech option. Well, oh my gosh, I had no idea. The, the MS 462, I saw one yesterday. It's something like 1,460 something bucks. Oh my gosh, I could have a truck repaired for that. Um, I, I can't go that high. Well, but, but it is the best of the best of the best. And, and that would be the good choice and it would last the longest, have the best resale value. I might not always have the, the cash flow that I have now. Maybe it would be better to do that. 
and I ended up settling on an MS391, which will do just a great job. I won't even use it for most of my little jobs. I won't need something that's quite that powerful. But this whole process I just went through talking about a chainsaw, the entrepreneur would have probably just made that decision in two seconds rather than my, in my case, weeks and weeks and weeks, months of just thinking about it and contemplate, oh, I can't pull the plug on that. Oh, I can't. I, I, oh, my God. And just, uh, yeah, I, that that's not a strong suit of mine. So what do I do as a person in the entrepreneur class who's really good at ideas, but isn't good at having the the willingness to take the risks to make those ideas come to fruition? And I'm really weak in the management area. We have this one thing, my wife and I right now, this one thing that we're thinking of doing that would drastically change our lives for the better. But it requires me to do a bunch of boring, rote, absolute management slash artist, boring manager work. And I know I need to do it. If I buckled down and did it, I could have it done in 40 or 80 hours. So less than a week's worth of work. I could have it done, but I just don't want to do it. And so I dragged my feet. And, oh, oh, you know what I could do? I could, wow, I, I could d design a new logo in Canva. Well, that's not what needs to be done. Um, I need to do the boring manager stuff. So if you find that you're in one of these categories, but you're not perfect in every part of that category, it's okay. It's up to you how much you're going to push yourself to to go beyond that and get better at other categories and at other parts within your category. Um, completely up to you how much effort you want to put into that. So that's kind of, I think the first step is deciding is your job, your vocation, your role, is it what you want it to be? If, if you don't have that entrepreneurial thing, then if you don't have a very strong part of that in you, then don't even, when I, in all my videos, I say how I have a lot more respect for small business owners who started on their own and made it, built themselves up. Ignore me. That's, that's my route. That's my road. That's my thing. That's not yours. Yours might be very different. There are plenty of people who have been a CPA or a janitor for 35, 40, 50 years, done the same thing every single day, and they're happy with it. And in the end, they get a pension and, and it works out for them. And in the meantime, they they live happy lives. And, and there's, so there's nothing wrong with any of these categories. But I guess there would be a problem if you would be best and most natural and good at one category, but you're in a job that's a different category. You, you got to do some thinking there and, and figure out what you're going to do with that. Okay, so that's that's one piece of advice. If you are not happy in, in the place that you currently are, and this is this is something my friend mentioned that was brilliant. He says, uh, he says I, I, there, there are a number of things that it, I'm not loving about my job, but I don't think that just job hopping is the solution. I mean, the, the problem isn't the, the street address. And that is just such a brilliant thing to notice. It isn't the company you're working for that's the problem, probably. It isn't the town that you're in. Oh, the people here in Maine are just, you know, how grumpy they all are. Or, oh yeah, you know how Iowa is. Everybody just expects so much. No, making stupid generalizations like that, that's not helping you. That's Those are excuses. That's not probably isn't really how stuff is. So ask yourself, is this true? Is the thing I'm thinking true? Is it true that I'm being crapped on by my boss's because I'm the best person they've ever seen who's doing this job. Is that really true? Is it really true that you're not getting promoted because your gender or because your height or because of whatever? Is that really true? So think about your problems where you currently are. There's a good chance that those same problems would happen to arise somewhere else. And I don't like to think about this, but I am probably a big reason for where I am today, both the positive and the negative. Uh, I actually went ATVing with uh, a friend uh, a month or so ago, and he had been my boss back when I was a cop. And he said something to me. Uh, he said, you have no idea how many complaints you got when you were a cop. And I said, really? At citizen complaints? And he says, oh, yeah, like just so many. And I, well, 
I, I didn't have any idea. Like I thought I got one or two a year. Uh, like that's just, you're going to get that. But he's like, oh no, you, it was almost a full-time job dealing with all the complaints you got. And, and it was, you know, it wasn't generally for, for the heavy handed stuff that I feel most guilty about. It was for just being bored, being an artist in a boring bureaucracy. Like I, I'd be bored. So I would go up on someone else would make a traffic stop and I would go up to back them up. And when I was talking to people, I would just, I'd put on a Southern accent for the whole time I was talking to them. And that was just kind of how I kept myself occupied. Well, evidently I'm not very good at my accents because uh, he was telling me now, 20 years later or whatever, 15, 20 years later, he's like, oh no, people complained that they thought you were faking the voice that he says one person even asked if you were special. <laughs> <laughs> this may be my proudest blushing moment talking to him. I was rolling, laughing. Um, okay, so I was not good at that job. Well, huh, it's interesting. I got fired from a Southern California agency before that. Huh, when I left the, the job I had before that, um, and then I tried to go back because I wasn't happy at, a, at the second place, they wouldn't take me back. Huh. Do you think maybe the problem isn't the particular police department or sheriff's department? Do you think maybe I'm the problem? Well, of course I was the problem. Um, now I realize that years and years later, I definitely didn't see it at the time. Everybody else just didn't appreciate how awesome I was. But back then, I thought that they were the problem. Now, I completely think I was not a good fit to be a police officer. It just, it wasn't right for me. I sucked at it. I shouldn't have been doing that. I'm glad I quit. I was, yeah, I, I wasn't fired. I was, I was pressured out, but I made the choice to quit. Could I have stayed on and, and maybe fixed myself? Yeah, maybe, but I didn't realize I needed fixing at that time. I thought it was everybody else's fault. So I guess my advice is if you're not thrilled in your job, why not? Like, are you doing the actual work that you want to do? Oh, and then there's the other part. There are the bosses, the manager types who have to be there to keep you going or you would, they're necessary in a business. Believe me, they're necessary. Well, why aren't they happy with you? Maybe you are so focused on your artistry, on being good at being a CPA, that you're not realizing that that's not the entirety of your job. As a CPA, your whole job isn't being in Excel and QuickBooks and crunching numbers and finding new laws and loopholes. That's not your whole job. Part of your job is making your customers thrilled that they have you as their CPA and that the firm that you're working for is an awesome choice for them and that they should stay with them long term and that your supervisor is an awesome person. So most CPAs are so busy crunching numbers that they don't think about that other aspect that's really important. So why is your boss always giving you crap about your CPAing? Well, yeah, you're pretty good at crunching numbers, but uh, you know, you're not getting the promotion. Well, have you been telling your, your clients how awesome your supervisor is? Have you been saying things when they thank you like, oh, thank you for this information. You're like, oh, you're so welcome. I'm, I'm glad that uh, my boss, Jerry, asked me to focus on this, and I'm, I'm glad we were able to find some great loopholes for you. That's our goal here at, at Brigham and Brigham CPAs. Like, have you been doing things like that to prop up the people ahead of you? Have you been politicking? If not, then you're not doing your job. You're doing what you think your job is, but you're not doing what the boss needs you to do. And the boss is the boss unless you want to be an entrepreneur. So think about that. Think about what does it take to get ahead in a company? Well, maybe it's not necessarily crunching numbers well as a CPA. Maybe that's not the thing that your focus should be on. You're already good at that. Maybe your thing should be social uh, social skills stuff. Maybe it should be thrilling your, your customers. On your personal social media, how often are you saying how much you love working for your company? Hey, we're having a a special on, on taxes this season, but man, we're filling up quickly. If anybody wants in, get in quickly. Uh, man, we're an awesome, awesome bunch I get to work with. Have you, have you been doing that at least once a week on your personal social media? If not, like, are you serious? Are you serious that you are relying on one source of income and you're not 
finding the time to spend two minutes a week to talk up and kiss butt to this organization and to be to ride for the brand and be in their corner and help support them? Why not? If you're not, and it's because you hate your company, well, find something else. Maybe then it is a location. Like if you don't like CPA work, then find something else. If you've come to the conclusion that CPAs are just kind of hired, I don't know, bad guys who help help the government steal from a you know free market job. If you if like if you have some twisted libertarian thought like that, okay, fine, go help, go help Reason.com pay less in, uh, to the government uh, or hand over less to the government. I mean, find something that has your skill set, your artistry, your knowledge but that's fulfilling a mission that you actually agree with. And if there isn't such a thing, I don't know, just think about it. Come up with some solution. I don't know what the correct solution is. That's that's what you've got to do. But that's part of that awesome chess game, the board game, the game game of life is just figuring out all these moves that you can make to make things work out better for you. And you get to do that. And you get to start doing it right now. How awesome is that? Like, I know I'm using this this exaggerated voice, but like I, I'm I'm honestly feeling that like it is so cool that I get to make these choices that will make me rich or poor. And of course, things can happen that would just automatically make me rich, automatically make me poor. But most of it's in my control. I can do that. That is awesome. That is awesome. So I don't know. Think from that perspective and find ways to get what it is that you want at your job. And while you're working your job. If you're currently in the employee class of people where you're working for someone else, if that's your your place in the cash flow quadrant, which, by the way, there are a couple books to read, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then his one of his other books, Cash Flow Quadrant. And yeah, the guy isn't 100% trustworthy. Um, I just say that word of mouth, but some, he's a friend of some friends and uh, acquaintances, and, and I'm not on... You know, I'm not sold on him, but his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cash Flow Quadrant are really worth uh, reading, listening to, whatever. So if you are an employee type of person, you work for somebody else, one other one other person or company or whatever, don't just be settled. It, it would be my advice. Don't just be settled in that position. Even if you're doing well, you should be developing your personal skills and personal brand. Think about how you want the world to look at you. If, if that job goes away because there's downsizing or the company goes under or you mess up one day and, and you know, do your meth on the, the staff dining room and they don't like that and fire you, whatever. I mean, stuff can happen in life. Be prepared for your step two. Like be ready to click into that immediately. And so how do you do that? Develop your your persona, your online, what you're telling the world about you. If somebody looks up your name, go look up your name on Google right now. Look up your name and see what comes up that is actually you and not other people. If you type it in and, and nothing's coming up on you, then put uh, quotation marks uh, at the beginning of your first name and at the end of your last name and see if anything comes up then. If it doesn't, that's fine. That's 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 fine. That's better than if bad things are coming up. Um, but you get to build then what it is that you want to have come up online and make it good. So here's everybody should have a LinkedIn page. If you're not a conspiracy theorist that LinkedIn is just a CIA plot to find out what you're doing for a living or something uh, like it's up to you. In all honesty, I believe there are a lot of bad actors who are conspiring. And then I also think that things are probably going to go kind of like they always have for the last thousands of years. And there are going to be some bad times and there are going to be some genocides and there it could be here and it could be. But overall, like it's, I think it's a okay plan to have a LinkedIn profile. And that profile should have you in a very professional photograph. It should have you in a suit if you're a guy. Um, I don't know what's professional for women now. And actually, I wouldn't do what's now. I would look what was professional for a woman in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, that's more of a classic thing. And in the 20s, what would one of Ayn Rand's heroes have, what would Dagny Taggart have worn to a business meeting? If you're a gal, wear that. That's classic. That'll always, always be there. When you have photographs that go out 
online that you're putting out there to the world. Don't put out something of you vomiting at a frat party while some 16-year-old girl is flashing you in the background. Like, do professional stuff. Um, it's up to you to control your online presence. And people who have money and are serious about life and business and reputation, they pay agencies to manage their online reputation. And I'm not saying you have to go hire a consultant to do this. Just basically live a good life and don't put crap out there that you wouldn't be proud of. So make sure that if people look up your name online, that they see professional images. Okay, you don't really have a way to do it. You don't know how to do web design. You're not sure about all this tech stuff. Well, send me a photograph of yourself looking really sharp and professional. And then I will call you, I don't know, viewer of the week and put you on my website. And then yeah, maybe you don't want it on mine because I'm, I'm a voluntarist and that's not very mainstream. But then if somebody types your name in a few months later after the crawlers have found it, it's indexed on Google, then they see this picture of you popping up wearing a suit. Well, that's going to help you when you go for your next promotion, especially if you're working as a lumberjack or something. They're like, oh, this guy also has management potential because of a suit. Make sure that your online present doesn't make you look like an immature piece of crap. Make sure that it makes you look like a serious, cheerful, happy, positive, fun professional. Uh, that's that's a big piece of advice there. And, and, you know, speaking of the the positive, cheerful professional, that's the biggest thing. You know, if you go into work and you're happy and you're smiling at everyone and you compliment a different person each day in your office, shop, company, whatever... If you're just that positive ray of sunshine and then you do a really crappy job at your regular work, you'll probably still be okay. But if you do the opposite and you're really good at your regular work, but you're not complimentary of people and they're not walking away with their shoulders back and beaming with pride after having talked to you, well, then you might not do so well. Isn't that weird that what you think you were hired for to be a CPA, that's not really what it's about. But if you can bring up the whole energy of the office by your fun, happy, cheerful, positive being, that's what will get you promoted and loved and such. Okay, so that's the, that's the happiness, positive uh, part of things. What else for, for a job? Oh, I, I think realizing that it's just a job. It's just work. Like, I hope you're not choosing your friends from work. Some of them will be. There's some people there who will also have other things that you're interested in. And yes, you'll probably have a barbecue and invite everybody from work over and, and you'll have this fun off, off work time, but they're not interested in, I don't know, remote control airplanes like you are. They're interested in giraffe zoology or photosynthesis or religion or whatever. So make sure that away from your job, that's where you get your your friendship, your companionship, your living, your real living of life. And for me, my real living of life falls into several areas. Uh, one of those areas is voluntarism, economics, things like that. Um, and so Disenthrall Channel is a big place that I, I find that content, those people on the, uh, the various social networks. I think that's what Discord is. Um, I don't use Discord because, is it Matrix? I, I can't figure out the tech of it. But if you're young enough to understand that kind of thing, then uh, if you're listening to this, this podcast, then there's a good chance that you're a voluntarist leaning. If you're not already involved in all that social stuff, Discord and Matrix and Element and all that, um, go figure it out on, on the Disenthrall channel. It's a great community of good people. So I, I know I should be pointing you toward my community, but... <laughs> Go for that one. They've got it really set up. If you're older and you can't figure out all the, the tech of it, then I guess never mind. But um, still watch all the videos on, on Disenthrall. Uh, another community that I've found is, uh, because I'm interested in entrepreneurialism and business and such, uh, MJ DeMarco is an author. And not everything he says is right. I, I don't agree with everything, but he has a lot of great points. And he created a forum for people who read his books, uh, like Millionaire Fast Lane. I haven't read that one, but I've read his last two, and they're great books. Um, and so he has a, a forum 
uh, thefastlaneforum.com. And that's a great place for people who are serious about being entrepreneurs to go and uh, kind of have their community. The communities don't have to be geographical anymore. Uh, we have this opportunity that as long as the interwebs are up, we get to have more spread out broad communities. So those are a couple of my communities. Uh, another one of my communities is my my local community, my neighbors. And on my road, which is four or five miles long, there are only three homesteads really that are occupied. And the other two beyond ours, I have relationships with those people. And I don't necessarily see them daily or weekly, but I have good relationships with them. And that is an important part of my community is having, I, I think they respect me for the things I'm good at. They know my areas of weakness. They know that I appreciate their strengths. They know that I like them. Now, I'm not going to fake something. If I end up not liking some of them, then it is what it is. But as things currently stand, I like all of my neighbors and I treat them well and show them respect. And so that's part of my community also. And then I guess the last part of my friendship would be just lighter, more casual friendships with with people from my former careers. The um, night before last, I went to uh, down here in Arizona. It just so happens that one of the my former SWAT commander actually retired and moved uh, to this part of Arizona. And I went over to his place and we had ribs and we we just BSed and talked about the good old days and the 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 war stories and and then the last hour or two we started talking about crypto and prepping and voluntarism and I was very nice and polite and cool about it and I think they appreciated hearing this weird wacko for them out there stuff I did it in a nice way that wasn't turning offy um, but I do have that that group of friends also who if I want to have a deep intellectual conversation about some of Rothbard's work. Yeah, that's not where I'm going to turn. But I had a great evening hanging out with my friends. And so make sure you have those people outside of your work. Make sure that they're separate because they will be there for you longer and always. Uh, from a psychological standpoint, both with your friends and with your significant others, well, with a lot of people, try to have some, some rather edgy experiences, some memorable experiences. If you get together at the sports bar for lunch and you watch football and drink beer and make eyes at each other because you like the shitter on a particular critter, that's not creating huge long-term memories. If you go on a hike and one of you tumbles down the hill and almost dies, okay, that's a lifelong memory. That's a bonding moment. And I'm not saying to almost kill yourself, but tomorrow uh, I'm going out ATVing with a a friend of mine, he's also a voluntarist content producer who's way better at it than I am, like a hundred times better at it. Um, but we're going out ATVing and we're not purposefully doing it and saying, what can we go do that's dangerous? But I expect that at some point we're going to come across some obstacle, some hill, some rock that we're going to have to decide, do we have the skill level to continue or should we turn around? And sometimes we'll decide to turn around. Sometimes we'll decide to go for it. And there's a chance that we're going to roll one of the ATVs and break a leg and bend the handlebars. Do you think that if that happens, maybe we'll have a stronger, tighter bond for the rest of our lives? Do you think then that it would be harder to pull us apart if you if you didn't like the idea of us fighting for voluntarism? Um, do you think if one of us ends up going to jail for for bad thinking, what's that called? Uh, uh, is it 1984 or one of those things? Whatever, insog, bad thinking, whatever that would be. If one of us goes to jail for that, is there a, a good chance that the other one is going to make sure that we toss 100 bucks a month at their their uh, account in the jail so that they can buy $15 candy bars? Um, yeah. So I, I'm not saying that create fake artificial stuff, but go live some life. Do some experiences that could be a little bit out there and, and dramatic. And if you're making decent money, what's it cost to get an airplane ride from your city to a developing country city and go to the bad part of it? Maybe you get robbed. How cool of a story would that be for you just to, to think about? You, you and a buddy go and you guys get robbed and maybe one of you gets killed. Well, okay, that that's pushing it. But have these experiences is my 
my suggestion with both friends and coworkers and lovers. And it's, that's a good thing to do, I'm thinking. And finally, let's chat about FOO, F-O-O, Family of Origin. Uh, Stefan Molyneux, who used to be a, a voluntarist philosopher, and now he's more of a, I don't know, a radical right wing. Uh, anyway, back when he had some really good content he was putting out, this is 10, 15 years ago, something like that. Part of what really helped me as I was getting into voluntarism, he would talk about defooing. And he meant separating yourself from your family of origin. If they are toxic, if they're poisonous to be around, then don't keep being around them. If they are not your people, then why are you still choosing to spend your time and energy uh, being around them or thinking of them, considering them being part of their lives? Well, that was pretty radical advice. And I don't know. I think there could be something naturally, biologically, whatever we want to call it, that uh, uh, leads us to want to be close with our family of origin. Uh, there could be some tribal evolution, evolutionary or, or creationary or whatever you want to choose to think. There could be some good reasons for why it's good to be tight with your family unit, your extended unit, your brothers, sisters, parents, cousins, uncles. Um, I, I see some good arguments for it. And I also see some arguments against it. When bad times really come down, who is it that would take you with your two missing legs and let you come live in their spare room and help clean your crap up until you get your life back on track from this sudden horrific double leg uh, amputation? It, it's probably not going to be the really cool dude, former football player from your work. Probably not going to be that person. It's probably going to be your family, your blood family. Families seem to stick together. Now, maybe it's cultural. Maybe it's evolutionary. I don't know. But they do seem to stick together. So what if you don't really like your family or they don't like you? What if you guys each have different, I don't know, goals in life? Or maybe they don't even have any goals. Maybe they don't understand philosophy or even care about it. Maybe they don't care about physical fitness and they just let their bodies turn into lumps of crap. Maybe you guys just have completely different areas of interest, worldviews, etc. Should you then defoo, de family of origin? Should you just kick their butts to the curb and, and then pursue your own life and, and try to just ignore them, never be in touch with them? I don't know. I don't know. My suggestion would be not to do that. I think that for your sake and their sake, there are some benefits of being cool uh, with your family, that remaining involved with them. I don't always follow this advice. Um, I haven't uh, looked after or into my dad for, I think 2020 was the last time and it's now 2023. Um, maybe it was 21. I don't know. He has dementia. He was never a, a good dad. He's at some government veteran uh, memory care center um, five, six hours away. And I just don't, I don't put any effort into him. I probably should, it, not for his sake, but for my sake, because I'll probably feel guilty when he dies, if he hasn't already. But I just don't really, uh, he was never there for me. Uh, we're just, we're not tight. We're different people. And now he's even lost that brain. So I'm not necessarily living what it is that I'm preaching. But on the other hand, I kind of am. Um, one of my granddaughters came up to, for the first time, she got to fly alone at age eight. Um, of course, with the extra airline thing of you know them walking the, the kid from one gate to the other gate, et cetera. So it was safe. She came up to the ranch and, and spent a few days. And at the same time, my third or fourth cousin once removed, who's one of my, probably my closest other relative, she wants her two daughters to be more involved in family. That's a high value of hers. So she flew the three of them out to be with us for two or three of those days. And so all these distant, distant cousins got to meet each other and play and go on boat rides and shoot guns and archery and 
ATV and they got to have these good experiences together and build these extended family tribal bonds. So I am into that uh, in some ways and in other ways I'm, I'm horrible at it. So I guess do what you think is right, not what I do and not what I say, but it's something to contemplate how much you want to be around your family, uh, how much you appreciate them, how much you're going to do it from kind of a, a sociopathic and being a sociopath is not a bad thing. It's just it's it's a condition that you don't really have a lot of empathy or care about others. And it's more of a calculated thinking way of thinking. So you could say, OK, I don't really like my aunts and uncles and mom and dad. However, I want to stay somewhat involved with them and be on good terms. So every six months, I'm going to have my phone ding and I'm going to send them an old fashioned greeting card just saying, hey, happy summer to you. I hope you're doing well. I know our lives are going in other directions, but I just wanted you to know that I was thinking about you and send it to them. And then six months later, hey, it's that crazy holiday time. Um, Uncle Bill, I just wanted to say that, you know, you and I are on different paths in life, but I have always respected how you taught me to double tie my shoes or you know, whatever, something like that that's honest and true, but is nice. And the person is going to, yeah, it'll, it'll help your relationships. And you're then not going to have to spend time with them if you hate doing that. But you're keeping those, those ties, those bonds somewhat together. All right. Well, I have done a lot of rambling today. Uh, this is a long podcast compared to most of my others. If you're a Joe Rogan fan, this is a very short one. <laughs> um, uh, but this is just kind of addressing those those few things that that my friend mentioned he was in dealing with right now. Uh, and again, we started talking about uh, about you know relationships a little bit. Not not everybody in the relationship isn't perfectly happy. Problems at work, um, and then family. Issues and so I, I've kind of just offered some of the the junk I've gathered from my fifty years of experience, and uh, hopefully it's of help to my friend who I, I think will listen to this, and to anyone else who's listening to it that little parts or pieces are interesting or helpful. Um, yeah, I, I hope this this profited you because I'm a for profit kind of guy, and uh, I hope it brought you some profit. Please let me know if it did. Please tell me if you're struggling with something or or would like me to ramble a bit to help you maybe think of other perspectives you hadn't hadn't thought of yet. Now, as soon as you're done with this, if you have a little bit of extra time, if you're a little bit ahead on your drive, or if you're at home, um, it, whatever it is, if you can pull over, great. If not, just do it later. Do your list of five things for vocation, five things for a significant other, and five things for life. Write those down. Do that for at least a month. And then if you hate it, don't keep doing it. But I suggest you keep doing it. Look in the description. I've added the Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus book recommendation, a link for that, my affiliate link. I've added the Tony Robbins test, uh, artist, manager, or entrepreneur, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cash Flow Quadrants by Robert, those links, and a link to Fastlane Forum. Love y'all. Take care. Be in touch.